Okay, so this is the um, introduction to cryptology, which corresponded to our first class. Um, so across, uh, during this course, you will encounter essentially three different um, terms that are almost the same thing. And sometimes they're used sort of like equivalently, but it don't exactly mean the same thing. So let's just um, stop for a minute. Um, cryptology, cryptography, and cryptanalysis are things that we're going to talk about during this course. Um, cryptology is the more general term, and it's the study of, of writing in secrets. Why cryptography is just the uh, act of writing, and cryptanalysis is the deciphering, the analysis of the security. Okay, so um, although this course is called uh, Introduction to Cryptography, Really, it should be more something like introduction to cryptology. So a first example of a, of a cipher, a way of encrypting information, is attributed to uh, Julius Caesar. In fact, it's the most obvious way you could possibly think of uh, encrypting a message, and it's just based on substitutions. And, and substitutions are many ways of doing substitutions, but Caesar cipher is actually the most obvious substitution that you could ever think of. So the way it works is that um, each party uh, knows a secret shift of the alphabet. So for example, uh, in the case of our, um, in, in this example, um, let's say um, the two people communicating share the secret three, which means that in each message, to encrypt every letter has to be mapped to the letter that is three steps further down in the alphabets. For example, A gets mapped to D, and so on and so forth. And for the decryption, then you have to do the reverse operation, which means you shift backwards, three in this case. In that case, the D would be mapped back to an A. Okay? So, um, before we go any further, um, the C cipher is a good opportunity to give some formal definitions that we're going to be using uh, throughout the course. So um, the secret key, or the key when there's just one, is the secret, the, the part, um, the piece of information that allows you to uh, decrypt and encrypt in this case, and it's the shift of three. So that number three is your key. The plain text is your message before it's encrypted, and the cipher text is the encryption of the message. Okay, so key, plain text, and cipher text are notions that we're going to be using throughout the course. And before um, giving you more examples of, of, of elaborated ciphers, um, there's something to be said about what as it has to be kept a secret and what should not be considered a secret. And it's, it's, um, it's a principle that is um, attributed to Kirchhoff. And the idea being that the design of the crypto system is not a part of the secret. So in the case of the Caesar cipher, the example of the Caesar cipher, then what it means is that the, um, the, uh, the, the fact that we shift letters is not something that should be a secret. The only thing that is kept a secret is how much we shift the letter by. So the shift of three is the key, and the key by definition is everything that has to be kept a secret, and anything besides the key is supposed to be known by anybody, including the adversaries. Now, the weakness of the Caesar cipher um, besides the fact that, of course, the, the number of different shifts is very limited, the number basically of letters in the alphabet, so it's not really, I mean, there's really essentially 25 different ways of non-trivial shifts of the letters of the alphabet, um, so that's not a lot. But besides this, there's something more fundamental about the Caesar cipher that is insecure. So the most letter, the most common letter in the English language is the letter E. And what it means is that the, because the shift is the same for all letters, uh, the letter that will be uh, appearing the most in the ciphertext is, is most likely to be the uh, encryption of E, which gives away the shift automatically. So let's see an example of the plain text. So here is your example. And if we look 
at the number of occurrences of E, we see that we have 22 occurrences, okay? So now let's let's encrypt it with a secret key. Okay, this is the ciphertext you would get. So the first step in your crypt analysis um, of, of, uh, of the Caesar cipher would be to identify uh, what is the letter that comes um, that is um, the more um, that, that has the more most occurrences in this cipher text, and it turns out to be a letter H. So you conclude that H has to be the image of E under that secret shift, and that means that the shift must be three, and that gives you the way to secret key here. So you have um, a, tr a non-trivial variant of, of, of the Caesar cipher called the Visionaire cipher that takes care of the fact that we have very few keys. So the, the key space here is essentially the numbers of different shifts of the alphabet that you could, uh, you could possibly uh, apply to your plain text. It's 26, maybe 25 if you consider that the trivial shift consisting of not doing anything is not really something you want to do. But in any case, 25 or 26 is a very low number. But there is a way to sort of generalize the Caesar cipher to enlarge the, 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 the key space. So the way to do it is to choose the length of your series of shifts so, for example, um, if we choose a, a series of shifts of length five, then this is an example that I could possibly uh, think of. So 19, 13, 1, 11, and 5. And the way I'm going to apply those shifts is I will shift the letters of index 1, 1 plus n, 1 plus 2n, and so on with the first shift of the letter of the key. And then every other so uh, every uh, key, uh, letter of index 2, 2 plus n, 2 plus 2n, and so on, will get the second shift, okay? So what it means is two consecutive letters are never getting the, sh the same shift. It just repeats every n letters, in this case, n being equal to 5, and so on and so forth. So for example, here you see with 19, 13, 1, 11, and 5, the m gets mapped to f through a shift of 19, but e gets mapped to S by a shift of 13. So it means that M and E are not mapped, the, um, mapped according to the same shift, but then it loops back, right? After five shifts, so you have M and E and E and T and M, they're all shifted by different shift, but then you go back to shifting by 19, five letters down the road, and then five more letters you shift by 19, and five more letters, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now in this case, in the case of uh, n equals 5, then the number of different shifts that you could do, which is the, the cardinality of the key space, is essentially the number of shifts of the alphabet, let's say 26. Let's say that uh, the trivial shift is, 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 is a legitimate shift raised to the power 5. Okay, and then of course you can make that arbitrarily large by just raising the number n in this case, which could, you know, it, it grows exponentially. So you, you can choose what you think um, um, makes, you, makes your um, cipher um, resistant from um, uh, the brute force attacks and, 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 and choose that number. Okay, so here 5 for the sake of the argument. Now here's the problem though. Although we've um, we've uh, bumped up the size of the key space, it still suffers from the same drawbacks as the Caesar cipher. So it, in this case, we've chosen a key that is a shift of only a list of three shifts, okay? So one, two, one. And how, assume we don't know that and we try to do the cryptanalysis of, of the visionaire cipher in this case, now what we're going to do is we're going to split, we're going to take every third letter. So in this case, it's going to be the H and then L and then V and so on and so forth. And what it's going to, what's going to happen is if I know that the key has length three, then what I know here is that all these letters are shifted by the same amount. And moreover, 
I can assume that um, the, 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 the text, the plain text, was, uh, was written in English. And so the likelihood of getting an E is still the same, whether I take um, every third letter, or every fourth letter, or if I sample um, letters from, uh, from that text, then the E is still the most likely uh, letter. So this is my uh, cipher text. Then I'm going to take every third letter of that cipher text, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, and so on and so forth. Okay. Then that gives me this, okay? And I know for a fact they're all shifted by the same amount. And I noticed 11 occurrences of the letter F. And I draw the conclusion that all those letters were shifted by one because F has to be the image of E under the shift. Like there is the first shift of the key. So that gives away the one third of the key, which is the first shift, which is one. And remember, we said that it was one, two, one. Okay. So what it means is we found one of the shifts of the key, and you can repeat that operation for um, the second and the third by keeping, by creating a different subset of the ciphertext consistent every second letter and every third letter. Okay. So uh, the message here is that we have still have a something intrinsic about those substitution ciphers that it's insecure. Now the ultimate uh, substitution cipher is perhaps the Enigma machine. Um, so that is features in particular in a recent movie. Um, and um, the idea is that um, the shifts here are encoded in, in um, um, pieces of, of so each so in each, um, uh, so the, 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 the whole machine is made of uh, three pieces that rotate and each position of the piece uh, encodes uh, a particular uh, a permutation of the alphabet. And so what happens is every time somebody presses a key uh, in the keyboard, it sets those three uh, pieces to a certain configuration and then the next key will move one of the pieces and that will then switch the different um, to a different uh, permutation of the alphabet. So we substitute every time we press a key, we substitute a different way. Okay, so it makes it makes the number of possibilities very large, much larger than 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 one can manage. Okay, so um, in class we played uh, a couple of scenes from uh, the imitation game one of them basically saying that although the number of keys in the enigma machine are is unmanageable to a human being there is a way um, to sort of use information you have on the plain text by saying that you know in particular that a lot of those plain texts are weather reports and those weather reports, a specific formatting, they start a certain way and they end a certain way. And that actually reduces the search space as far as the possible, uh, the number of possible keys. And that was, um, that was given to you to introduce the notion of um, um, scenarios of attacks and, and something that will insist a lot during this class, uh, basically um, to say that what matters is sometimes um, what power we assume the adversary has. And in this case, we can assume that the adversary has knowledge of some encryptions of, of plain text or some knowledge of the plain text, which is not necessarily something that is uh, very natural. So we'll see later down the road that we give a lot of, usually in the attack scenarios, we give a lot of, intentionally give a lot of power to the adversary precisely to avoid situations like this. Now, uh, that, that imitation game movie is about Turing, and I just wanted to conclude by the fact that um, due to this and, and many other contributions, he's, he's credited to be one of the fathers of, of computer science. He, um, the, at, the end of, at, his, at the end of his life, he um, faced a lot of difficulties. Uh, he was imprisoned, uh, forced to take hormone treatment, and ultimately committed suicide by eating a poison apoison apple. And there, there was... You know, 
there was um, it used to be that the Apple logo was was a was a was a, an apple with a, a bite and and a rainbow um, fly on it, and by many it was interpreted as as a tribute to Alan Turing. Uh, according to my own research, unfortunately, that might have been just a myth. Uh, the explanation is a lot more, uh, it's, it seems to be more, a lot more coincidental, but nonetheless, um, Turing is somebody who's celebrated in the computer science community perhaps as, as the most prominent figure. So is definitely somebody worth studying. So that's it for today.